Good morning, everyone. I'm Sandy Barr. I'm the chapter director for Sierra Club in Arizona. I use she, her pronouns, and I live in central Phoenix. These are the traditional lands of the Akamal Atham and Peeposh. And I'm very happy to be here this morning for this important program. As some of you may have heard, recently the Environmental Protection Agency announced that 132 air monitoring projects in 37 states would receive more than $53 million from the Inflation Reduction Act and the American Rescue Plan. And this is to enhance air quality monitoring in communities across the country. In Arizona, Pima County, the Navajo Nation, Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, and the Kokopa tribe all were awarded funding for their projects. Today, we're going to hear about the Pima County monitoring project and how it can further our understanding and inform actions related to environmental justice. With us today are three panelists who are involved in this project. I will introduce all three. You'll hear from them about the project and then we'll take your questions at the end. Again, you can post your questions in the Q&A and uh, at any time during the presentation. We're, uh, we think we'll have um, at least 20 minutes at the end for questions, uh, so there should be plenty of time. So get your questions ready. All right. So um, our first panelist this morning is Natalie Shep. She's a senior program manager for outreach and education at the Pima County Department of Environmental Quality. And there she administers programs that support sustainable actions throughout Pima County, including the Clean Air Program. Natalie works with community partners, local jurisdictions, schools, and the University of Arizona to develop strategies and messages to encourage environmental sustainability. Natalie also serves on Pima County's environmental just as Pima County uh, Department of Environmental Quality's Environmental Justice Manager, and she's the Board Vice President for Community Gardens of Tucson. Our second panelist is Dr. Ashley Ann Lowe. Um, Ashley is, or Dr. Lowe, is a um, school-based researcher at the University of Arizona Asthma and Airway Disease Research Center. She's worked with approximately 500 schools across Arizona to implement school-based stock medication programs and other interventions aimed at improving health outcomes. Her primary research interests include asthma, health equity for women and children, and health disparities. And then our third panelist is Dr. Chris Lim. Dr. Lim is assistant professor of the Community Environment and Policy Department at the University of Arizona. Um, I should have noted, uh, Natalie also attended University of Arizona. So this is a, an all University of Arizona panel today. Um, so any um, Arizona State University fans, sorry. Um, and uh, Dr. Uh, Lim uh, research examines how the environment impacts human health, applying epidemi epidemiologic, I, 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 worked on that, statistical and data science methods. Specifically, he is interested in the health effects of air pollution and climate change, and whether there are disparities in the exposures and associated health outcomes. He also explores the potential application of low cost sensor technologies for personal level exposure assessment, urban air pollution modeling, and community-based environmental justice projects. I want to thank uh, all three of our panelists today. We're really looking forward to learning more about this exciting project. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Natalie. Thank you so much. We're really happy that you invited us here to share the, uh, what, what we plan to do with this grant funding. Um, we will be talking about the this particular project. We received almost $500,000 over three years. Uh, for the expanding localized air quality monitoring at Pima County Schools to address environmental justice. We're going to give you some information about what our plans are. Um, so we'll get started now. Go ahead, next slide, please. 
So first I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about our local situation here in Pima County. So this is a map of Pima County. We are located uh, on the Southern border of Arizona. And as you can see here, we're a very large county. We're about the size of Vermont. Um, and so we have a wide variety of, of natural resource areas, including a national, Saguaro National Park, which is on both sides of the city of Tucson, the east and west side. Got the Coronado National Forest, Ironwood uh, Forest National Monument, Oregon Pipe on the west side. Um, and so we do have a lot of pristine Sonoran Desert here. And um, our population here is approximately 1 million people. Most of those people, um, or a large chunk of them, are in eastern Pima County and Tucson and the surrounding unincorporated area. Next slide. So these are um, some maps that kind of define our air quality situation. We operate um, within a Tucson air planning area for some of our plans. So this is the air planning area, and this is where um, the uh, it, most of our population resides here. Um, uh, and then on the right side, uh, we have a map that shows our non-attainment and maintenance areas. So for most of Pima County, um, we are considered to be in attainment with the national ambient air quality standards that are set by EPA to protect public health for six uh, criteria pollutants. Um, this larger green area is um, what used to be a non-attainment area for carbon monoxide, but for many, many years it's been clean. Uh, there's been um, various laws that have gone into place, namely um, when catalytic converters were in incorporated into motor vehicles, that's when we saw a big change in the amount of carbon monoxide that we were dealing with. So we haven't had a carbon monoxide issue in well over 20 years now, um, but this is the map of that maintenance area that was the formerly the non-attainment area. We do have one non-attainment area and it's a PM10 non-attainment area in the Rito area, which is just Northwest of Tucson. Um, and PM10 is a particulate matter of 10 microns. Um, and so it's essentially dust. Um, and so this particular area still does deal with dust issues. There's a lot of agriculture over there. There's a large cement plant. Um, there are dirt roads. And so even just vacant lands that contribute to uh, particulate matter. So that is a non-attainment area in that section. And then there's a small area um, over here, the San Manuel SO2 maintenance area which used to have a mine, um, a, uh, a smelter that contributed to that, but that also has not been an issue for many, many years. So when you look at kind of um, where we are with the health-based standards set by EPA for criteria pollutants, um, you would actually um, see that for Pima County, we are in a pretty good place and that our air is um, quite clean for a city of our size. Next, next slide, please. This is a map of uh, Pima County's air quality monitoring sites. So these are monitors that we report data out to the public as well as to, as to EPA. And we do collect data for five of the six criteria pollutants, which are particulate matter 10 and 2.5, ozone, SO2, um, nitrogen uh, dioxide, and S, uh, sulfur dioxide. So um, these are these provide a variety of different data at the different sites. They don't all monitor for all of those pollutants. That, of it, that information and the data that we collect is available on airnow.gov, and you can always see what those monitors are picking up at any point in time. Um, one, we did recently add a new monitor, a near road PM 2.5 monitor um, that is not on this map, but. Um, uh, you can see that we, we've, so we've got a total of 15 that are pretty well spread out throughout the city of Tucson. Next slide. So I'm going to show you a series of maps to kind of paint a picture for you. Um, and I want to just make some, um, give you some information about what these maps display. It's not exactly uh, intuitive. So these maps were generated with a tool called EJ Screen, which is a, a tool that um, was developed by the EPA in order to assess communities um, and make determinations based on demographic and environmental indicators. So um, we, we look at EJ indices through this map. So I wanna just kind of um, explain to you that these particular indices, they combine demographic factors with a single environmental factor. 
Um, and they calculate a specific EJ index. Um, the, the, uh, the model uses a formula to combine a single environmental factor with a demographic index. In this case, it's just showing the demographic index, but the demographic index that, that it's comparing it to is um, the low income and people of color populations. So when you look at these, you will see that um, the areas that have the highest amounts of um, low income and people of color populations, and then you'll see how it's relative to whatever the index is that we're displaying. Those are displayed in percentiles. And so those percentiles are a comparison between what we see here and the national average. So anything that's over 50% is gonna be higher than the national average. And those dark red areas and those orange areas are the ones that um, we really should be calling attention to. Those are the areas that really stand out um, depending on the index that we're talking about. So in this case, we're just looking at low, the low income and people of color population. These are socioeconomic indicators for Tucson. And you can see here that um, it's on the south side. So south of Interstate 10 is where we see um, the dark red. Uh, we also see it out near the reservation. And these are, these are displayed based on census tracts. So um, you can see this large orange area here is the Tohono O'odham Reservation. And that's one census tract because it's a um, small population. And then the census tracts within the city are much smaller. So um, when you see those blocks, those are census tracts. Um, and so this kind of just shows you a few different areas, but you can definitely see that it's south of Tucson that has the, the um, lowest income and highest number of people of color. So we can go to the next slide. So now we're going to get into a couple of environmental indicators. So this is um, what EJ, EJ screen reflects with respect to air toxic cancer risk. And so you can again see that um, it's the southern part of Tucson and these um, south, south, southernmost areas here, um, just north of the airport that we have the highest um, prevalence of um, air toxic cancer in, in that region. Next slide, please. And then this is uh, definitely demonstrates a different picture. Um, this is relative to ozone. So they are comparing this with the data that we collect at our monitoring sites. And you will see that we do have, again, in that area in the South um, uh, is, is all red there for ozone, but there are other areas of the city that also have pretty high values. And what you do need to remember is that most regions in the United States, remember this is comparing it to the national per percents, um, actually don't have ozone problems. So it's some larger cities, uh, warmer cities. Phoenix has a pretty considerable ozone problem. And so um, Tucson definitely does have higher ozone levels than the majority of the United States. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna be looking at health disparities. And because um, we really wanna uh, focus on um, things like asthma, Ashley has a, a lot of work that she's done um, with asthma. They, this is the, um, the prevalence of asthma. They only collect data for people 18 and over. So this data does not reflect children, unfortunately. Um, but you can see here that the Tohono O'odham Reservation really stands out. And then in some of these other areas here, um, I, we do have the Pascua Yaqui Reservation. I believe those are also included. So we do see higher prevalence of asthma on um, indigenous lands. Next slide, please. This is um, also pulled from EJ Screen, and we report uh, data on our class one air pollution sources. So class one air pollution sources are those that are permitted by the Pima County Department of Environmental Quality. And we, we permit those sources based on their potential to emit um, certain, any, any number of the criteria pollutants that are regulated. So you can see here, that we have um, a good number of them located in our industrial area, which is near the interstate, just north of the interstate, and then um, just north of the airport. So you can kind of see here, we don't have really any class one sources in the foothills area uh, where the upper income folks live. Most of them are um, to the south along the highway. And you can kind of imagine what those industrial areas would look like. There's a lot of different um, processes that are happening there. And I will, um, in 
upcoming slide, I'll, I'll show you some of those things that, um, that we permit that would fall in the category of a class one air pollution source. Next slide, please. So this calls out one particular area that, um, and you can see here that this is, um, this red line here is Interstate 10. And um, I wanted to highlight this area because it really does have quite a concentration of air pollution sources, uh, the class one, the larger air pollution sources um, in a, a pretty small area. So we've got the Tucson International Airport, the Davis Monthan Air Force Base and the interstate. In addition, we have our power plant, the Tucson Electric Power Plant, which um, burns natural gas, no longer burns coal, but it is still a large source of air pollution because of the natural, natural gas that it burns. Tucson Iron and Metal um, doesn't really sound like, a, it sounds like a place that would maybe deal with scrap metal, but in this particular case, it actually um, burns almost all contraband that's captured uh, at the border. And we've had some significant compliance issues with that facility. Um, so I wanted to call that one out. And then we've also got our pulp, uh, bulk pet petroleum tank farm. Um, we have the Los Reales landfill, which is um, that landfill is now the only landfill operational in Tucson. And it is um, flaring their methane still into the atmosphere. So that is a class one source. Um, and then you can see here on the left-hand side, there's a high school right there, Desert View High School in the Sunnyside School District. Um, and I also want you to kind of look at this area here just south of Desert View High School and you can kind of see that it's vacant land. And so I wanna show you the next slide. And I'll get back to that vacant land in just a minute. So we do need to talk about, if we're gonna talk about environmental justice, we really need to look at it in a historical context. And especially in Tucson, Tucson has quite a sordid history with environmental justice issues. Um, if you are from this area or live in this area, I'm sure you know about these things, but it may not be so well known to those who aren't from Tucson. Um, so in, um, in the 1950s, trichloroethylene, was an issue. Um, it's an industrial solvent and it was dumped in areas of South Tucson. And over the course of the following decades, um, there were certain areas that developed cancer clusters among the residents who lived in the, in the South side areas. And it contaminated the groundwater as well as the soil. And so in 1982, EPA designated the Tucson International Airport as a Superfund site. It is still a Superfund site. It's our only Superfund site. And um, over the course of the following decades, a total of um, $130 million in claims have been settled because of the um, health effects that were um, due to the trichloroethylene contamination. 1,4-dioxane um, also, has also been linked to um, disease in that area and it's been um, contaminated the groundwater and soil in that same area. Um, and today we are, as, as many places in the United States are, we're dealing with um, PFAS substances that have also contaminated the groundwater. And the, the plumes that we're finding for those substances are also in the same general vicinity on the south side of Tucson. So um, right now, um, the Tucson water has been testing for P PFAS since 2009. And um, they are they do feel very confident that PFAS water is not currently being served. They've shut down the wells and they are treating it presently. Um, and they do keep a very close eye on it. Um, so that is continuing today. Um, most of these issues um, that, that have been mentioned um, are uh, linked to the Davis Monthan Air Force Base or those uh, affiliated industries. But the Air National Guard and Tucson Airport, that whole area there um, has done a variety of different things over the course of decades that has contributed to environmental justice concerns in that area. And those concerns um, still, still linger today. So um, we could go to the next slide. So this, this was that, that area that I just pointed out that's just south of Desert View High School. Um, and you can see on the lower right-hand corner is Los Realis landfill. So this is a um, one mile um, square, one square mile area 
And this is the plan development that is um, that is, exists at this moment. So you can see here that all those brown areas are residential plan developments. Um, and then the dark brown is residential and commercial. And then we've got multi-use. Um, and so um, the, there are plans to continue to bring more people into these areas. And um, typically because they are located where they are, um, they are more low income people. So um, this is something that uh, is concerning to me that, uh, that we continue to bring more people into this area before we address these environmental issues. Um, and so hopefully this grant will kind of help facilitate some more data collection so that we can really understand from an air quality perspective what's going on in these um, smaller communities beyond just what we're um, monitoring for at, at our existing monitoring sites. Next slide, please. Take it away, Ashley. Thanks, Natalie. Yes, hi, I'm Ashley Lowe, and um, most of my research has really been in school-based asthma, but I have been um, privy, privy to working with approximately 250 plus schools here in the Tucson metro area and more in the surrounding areas and other counties across Arizona. So I wanted to briefly kind of give a background picture of our schools here in Pima County and kind of relate it back to what Natalie just illustrated on her previous slides. This here, of course, I have to call out the Miranda School District is a, a picture of their beautiful campus. So I just want you to envision that as I kind of um, discuss in detail a little bit about our schools and where they're located. This picture of children playing on the fields, um, enjoying what appears to be soccer and sports. And here in Pima County, uh, we have about 17 uh, public school districts and one transportation district. For those located in a transportation district, what that means is that children um, in outlier kind of areas are um, transported into neighboring districts. That includes about 241 uh, public schools that serve approximately 160,000 plus students. But of course, we also have charter schools that are uh, distributed across mostly the Tucson metro area uh, that serve about 30,000 students. And then lastly, we have approximately 66 private schools uh, that serve an additional 15,000 students. Most of these schools are located in Tucson metro. Um, and here's a map that kind of illustrates the distribution of the school. Um, again, Tucson is kind of a, a, a larger area geographically, but not all of our schools are located here. And um, I want to kind of uh, discuss a little bit about my experience working in schools is based um, a lot around asthma, but um, I have a program near and dear to my heart called the Pima County Stock Inhaler for Schools program, which provides school stock albuterol medication that is typically used to treat respiratory distress or asthma exacerbation. So in my work um, of managing that program for the past six years, in about 250 of these schools that you see here, I've been able to collect not only quantitative data on respiratory distress events, but a lot of qualitative and anecdotal evidence uh, surrounding some of the triggers for respiratory distress at our schools. And when I uh, speak to school nurses, uh, often what I hear them say is a child comes in from that PE field that you just saw, or maybe they're just outside. They could be located inside the school. But some of these things that they'll tell me is, well, it was a really dusty day, or there was a lot of um, what appeared to be air pollution or sediment or you know, just a particulate matter in the in the sky, or they'll say, well, they're harvesting the fields, and, you know, it was just one of those days they, they came and um, harvested the cotton. Or I've actually even heard um, from a couple of our schools, uh, well, uh, you know, there's a mine close by, and they, you know, the dust picks up. And so thinking through that, I wanted to go back to kind of the, the public district boundaries and discuss that for a minute. And you can see here, um, in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, this is kind of um, the perimeter or you know the, the map of our county. 
And most of our schools do reside in the Tucson metro area, which is right here um, in, in eastern Pima County. But we do also have districts in western Pima County, um, the Ajo Unified School District. Uh, it's located about two hours from Tucson Metro, so we are very ge geographically distributed when it comes to schools. But looking at these uh, Tucson area schools, um, it's interesting to hear this, um, these stories and, and this um, kind of qualitative data come from nurses. So up here, we have the Marana Unified School District. It's lower elevation. There's a lot of agriculture that goes on. And if you think back to Natalie's previous illustration, this is where they had a lot of um, PM.10, um, correct, Natalie, um, very high levels up here. We have the I-10 corridor that comes up through here. And as you drive through this region towards Pinal County, you'll hear of the dust storms that come through. And of course, uh, we have, again, lots of agriculture, cotton is harvested, et cetera. And schools are distributed throughout this entire area. What I like to refer to as Miranda's kind of sister area is Vail. It has similarities, but it's located on kind of the, the other end, the opposing end of Tucson here in the um, south south uh, east. And Vail is similar because it's also slightly uh, lower elevation in some areas, and it does have the I-10 corridor running through it, where they also have agriculture and dust storms that come through. And then pointing more south, we have Sawarita, which has both uh, the open pit copper mining going on, but they have uh, lots of pecan fields and, and things of agriculture happening down here. What's interesting is this little district called Continental Elementary School District. There's actually one school that's a unified school district located here very close to Madera Canyon. And um, when we think about schools and why location matters and how air pollution might impact uh, um, respiratory events, right? Uh, this school, you kind of wind in back in there to get there and it's on the opposing side of the um, railroad tracks. So thinking through these respiratory events and uh, how that can impact emergency medical system response time is important. When we go back up, we have our metro schools in this area, and we have Sunnyside, which is, um, as Natalie already indicated, located in really a um, stronghold for pollution sources. And then Tucson Unified, which is a, our largest school district and a most populated uh, school district as it comes to student population. And then we have our upper income schools located up here that don't have or aren't exposed to the air pollution sources that some of our other school districts are. What I did want to point out is one district that I think is unique, and that's the amphitheater uh, public schools. And um, this district is interesting to me because it is not only geographically kind of large for a school district, but it also has um, a diverse socioeconomic spectrum of the families that attend it. So down here we have um, some lower income families, but also up here towards the Oro Valley um, area, we have upper income. And you have Highway 77, which is Oracle Road and a very busy road that runs basically through the district and schools are located right off of that. So I wanted to just kind of highlight our schools and some of the things that Natalie um, had, had discussed in the previous slides and we'll kind of move uh, forward to Dr. Lim and hear more about um, how we can examine uh, the air quality and the data. Thank you, Ashley. Um, so I'll be discussing um, the methods that we'll be using to measure air quality in Tucson. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'm an exposure scientist. So I work with low-cost air pollution sensors to measure air quality. Um, so these low-cost sensors you see in this slide are purple air on the left and air beam on the right. And these are um, sensors that cost about $250 per unit. And these sensors are <coughs> um, increasingly popular by citizen scientists to uh, measure their local air quality um, across the U.S. 
So the picture on the bottom you see um, is a, um, a, picture, a screenshot from a Google Home device that also shows um, Purple Air readings. So Google has incorporated Purple Air data into their uh, map platform so that people can visualize and see um, their uh, air quality exposure at their homes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the main advantage of these low-cost sensors are that since they are um, a lot cheaper to operate and own than traditional um, regulatory monitors, um, normal citizens can um, install and operate these sensors at their homes. So the picture on the left is um, San Francisco showing um, one location for a regulatory government-run monitor in the entire city. And the picture on the right is um, where these purple errors, uh, the low-cost air pollution sensor I mentioned earlier, are across the city. And as you can see that there's a lot of these low-cost sensors across the entire city. And um, having all these locations to measure air pollution is important because air pollution can level, um, vary um, significantly across very short distances, uh, such as by uh, near major roadways and across time. So if you can um, picture like a bunch of cars sitting in traffic, that um, the air pollution generated from that event would not be captured by uh, a regulatory monitor that's a couple miles away, whereas these purple, mon uh, purple air monitors can capture uh, such an event. And another advantage of this uh, low-cost sensor uh, is that they also report minute-by-minute minute, um, data, so very uh, fine temporal-wise, whereas the regulatory monitor on the left only would report hourly data. So you can get a very um, detailed idea of air pollution levels varying uh, over a very short time and um, space. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and here's a map showing purple airs in Tucson. Um, so as you can see that there are uh, multiple purple air monitors across the city um, as well, but not as dense as what we saw in San Francisco. And one notable um, one uh, note to make is that all these uh, low-cost sensors tend to be in the Catalina uh, area as well as Oro Valley, uh, including ones downtown, which I'll mention later. But these um, low-cost sensors in this Oro Valley and Catalina foothills area kind of shows that there is also a socioeconomic gap in terms of uh, data, air quality data as well when it comes to uh, low-cost sensors. Next slide, please. Uh, these low-cost sensors, um, other than being used for citizen science and um, um, citizen science purposes, they're also being used for research. So here's an example um, from a study recently done in California, where they combine satellite data with <laughs> uh, purple air data to improve their um, models' cap capability to measure and model PM 2.5 levels across um, the city of California, and they were able to improve um, performance, model performance over just using satellite-based um, data to uh, map uh, PM 2.5 levels across California. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in my own research, I've also um, worked closely with these low-cost sensors. So I installed um, about 20 purple air sensors across uh, the, the, U of a, uh, the University of Arizona campus. Um, so here's a, a, a screenshot showing um, an online platform showing the locations of these purple errors across campus on the left. And on the right is a, a data platform or a plot or a map, uh, not, sorry, not a map, uh, a graph of uh, purple air data um, at a location on campus showing uh, minute by minute data uh, real time so that students and uh, university community members can view their um, exposure to air quality um, as they uh, go about their day. Uh, next slide, please. And in my other uh, previous research project, I've applied these low-cost air pollution sensors to um, sample air quality across a city. Um, in this case, this was uh, Seoul, uh, South Korea. 
So I recruited students to um, walk around um, these five routes on the left repeatedly across a two week period. And using the collected um, air quality data, uh, which was collected using AirBeams, which is a portable PM sensor, um, I, I took the collected data to model air quality um, within the city. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and the modeling approach was a, um, done by a technique called land use regression. Um, so this is the um, idea that um, air pollution levels um, are impacted by nearby land use. Um, land use, though, um, air quality nearby major highways and roads will have worse air quality, whereas um, air quality um, near parks and mountains and green spaces will have better air quality. So using that idea, we can um, draw a circle around a point, um, and the point would be uh, air pollution level. And we can extract land use within the circular buffer and use that as predictors for the air quality at the center. Uh, next slide, please. And using that approach, um, I used um, statistical approaches to model air pollution levels across um, Seoul, South Korea. So on these um, plots, I uh, apply different approaches. On the left is a statistical approach called linear regression. And the, the next two plots are uh, machine learning based approaches. And using these um, approaches, we can see that there are spatial differences in PM2.5 levels across the entire city. So you can see that there are some red spots where air quality is worse and the green and the blue spots where air quality is pretty good. And in this case, those would be the mountains and the red spots would be the major uh, highways. Um, next slide, please. So in our EPA grant, um, we'll be using this instrument called Quanti Q module air. So um, this is also a low cost uh, air pollution sensor that measures one minute interval um, air quality, um, uh, one minute um, intervals of air pollution data. And the advantage of this uh, Quanti Q sensor is that uh, it measures both particles and gases. Um, so the purple air scenario beams I mentioned earlier, they measure uh, PM, uh, particle matter, but the quant AQ will be also able to measure uh, carbon monoxide, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and nitrogen oxide, which can also impact human health. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and our um, goal for the EPA grant will be to first establish a network of 30 uh, quantity IQ sensors at schools across Pima County. Um, second, we'll be um, creating a real-time machine learning based uh, model uh, using land use, traffic, and weather data. And finally, we'll be um, constructing an online data platform that will be available to the public so that they can view, map, and um, they can view plots and see maps and also download the raw data that we'll be collecting um, at these 30 locations. Um, next slide, please. Sure, and I'll just um, speak briefly about um, how we're going to involve schools. Um, of course, we wanted to leverage this well-established partnership that we've had with not only the University of Arizona, but Pima County Department of Environmental Quality and SHWEC, which is a component or a, um, a, a part of the University of Arizona who works extensively with not only the health department, but other community organizations. And we've also partnered for this time with seven local public school districts consisting of 178 schools. Um, I'm gonna actually skip forward to the next slide and then come back to the slide really quick. Um, I think it's important to kind of demonstrate the program reach. And while this um, list does contain the um, seven public districts demonstrating that there's about 178 schools serving almost 100,000 children, we don't want to exclude any district who has interest in participating in this opportunity, especially those that um, are located in um, further parts distance-wise in Pima County. Um, so kind of, um, we're very excited about the potential to work with these districts and um, really in partnership with them. 
And what we intend to do is um, basically work with these districts and their, their staff, their teachers, um, their science teachers, their district health nurses, um, and involve the students uh, throughout the process. And um, using kind of a student-led community science approach, we're going to um, work with them to understand the data that's being collected from these air sensors and also understand data stewardship, which is really an important uh, component of the research process. Uh, we're gonna work with them um, to um, understand how to work with these mobile low cost sensors like the AirBeam. Um, and then also understand air pollution science and its related health effects. How does uh, this air pollution impact not only them, but their community? And lastly, uh, the relationship between the data that we're collecting and um, localized environmental justice issues that are also identified by the students themselves. Uh, so we're going to create this curriculum and lessons that facilitate this learning approach uh, through student inquiry, um, which includes the analysis of the local air pollution data that we're, um, or air quality data that we're collecting at each of the sensor sites. Um, and then we are also going to work very specifically with each of um, the districts to identify the most appropriate locations to place these sensors. Um, so we're very excited about this opportunity and these plans. And again, um, I think that concludes uh, the webinar portion and we are happy to take any questions Thank you so much. Wow, it's an exciting project and really interesting. Uh, any questions? You want to put those in the Q and A um, part. If you uh, look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little thing that says Q and A, and you can put questions in there. While we're waiting for people to type their questions. Uh, and I, I don't know if I missed this, but kind of what is the overall time frame of the project? And um, uh, I, I know part of it, I guess, will depend on when you get the funding, but what is the um, overall time frame of the project? I can answer that. So um, this will be a three-year project. Um, and of course, our first step will be working with the districts to cite the sensors. Um, and then during that time, we'll also be kind of simultaneously developing the curriculum. So there'll be a lot of work that we're doing directly with the schools um, to get the process started. And then, and then the second and third year is when we'll be working, when Chris will be working to get his, um, get the data collected and get the model up and running and then working on um, trying to facilitate a, a public facing interface uh, online to display that data. So um, yeah, that'll be over the course of three years that we hope to, to get all this work accomplished. So I assume part of that then will be, um, you'll have some kind of transition process, like because the student led part of it, some of those students will graduate and leave school and that, um, process. So is that one of the things that is built into the project as well? Or are you just waiting to connect with the schools to develop those kinds of details? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. So we are specifically going to target high school children or um, adolescents rather grades nine through 12. And of course, yes, um, seniors graduate each year, but it will be an ongoing process um, led through the data collection process, all the way to kind of understanding um, the data and, and developing the curriculum in partnership with the schools. So they're gonna have um, a say in how that process actually unfolds. And so we'll determine some of those specific um, kind of components of you know um, students um, graduating per se. But what's also very exciting about this is this is going to be publicly available data to all of the, the public, right? So regardless if a student 
graduate, uh, they'll have access to the data that is produced by these um, air monitors and able to still kind of um, look and examine some of these things that they learn throughout the, the curriculum. All right, I have one more question uh, and others please uh, weigh in, but, uh, and this one is a little bit more in the policy arena. So if you don't wanna answer it, um, you know, you just can stay silent. But I, um, we've, we've seen a lot of research um, over the years, uh, you know, and not, not um, specifically uh, in Pima County relative to air quality, but in a number of other areas um, about the disparate impact uh, that uh, air pollution has on uh, people of color, particularly. And uh, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on, you know, why we don't see more policies to actually address um, address those impacts and and um, work on you know prevention, if you will. So is that uh, I, yeah, I, I personally think that the missing piece is is data. Um, and that's why the, 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 that's what makes this so exciting is that we can look at air pollution sources. We know how much they're emitting. But we really don't know who's being impacted and by how much from, from those sources. Um, and there are other sources of air pollution that aren't permitted by our department um, that wouldn't be included in that. And so we, we have a kind of a picture of like the large sources, but when you take into account you know, the geography and weather and um, various, just all these different factors, when you don't have data, you can't create policy because at this point in time, um, it would just be conjecture that certain populations are being exposed more. And so what I hope this facilitates is um, the data collection that, that will give us some information about which populations are being most impacted and then um, help us then facilitate some policy initiatives um, that could um, help improve that. Um, that could be maybe not planning for people to be near them. That, you know, it might be zoning. Oftentimes environmental justice issues are really very tied to zoning rules and things along those lines. So that's a multi-jurisdictional process since each jurisdiction has their own zoning rules. Um, so I do think that this is a really good starting point and it's kind of what we've been missing in order to actually appropriately address these potential problems. Yeah, and I have to add to that, Natalie, because I 100% I agree with you. When we look at, um, say, the Stock and Healer program, which I, I discussed earlier, uh, that program has been implemented for six continuous years in Pima County schools. And again, I can tell you quantitatively that a particular school located in a particular district might have used a stock inhaler um, 30 times within a three week period. And all I can say is that the school nurse might say, well, they, they were harvesting the cotton fields. We have no actual data to demonstrate a correlation there um, and that that could be a potential, potentially impacting respiratory distress events. So we need the data before we can make an impactful change, especially with when it comes to policy. Great, thank you. Um, and then next question, I think you might have partially answered it, but um, can you speak to how the data that will come from this project is used to inform actions or policy to address pollution, whether that be locally or by EPA? Yeah, I think um, at this point, that's we, we aren't sure. We, it's really gonna have to depend on what we find. Um, and so that we, I don't know if those, that question could be answered at this time. My hope would be if we, if we find the hotspots areas that are dealing with particular air pollution issues that we can, um, continue to involve the students in that process, because I do believe that youth voice is very powerful. And if we can get the, um, students involved in trying to facilitate some of those changes, but that's what I would be pushing for also working with their own communities to um, highlight some of those issues and what they'd like to see 
some of these issues um, won't be easily solved. So if you kind of think back to some of the sources, we've got Interstate 10, we've got a power plant, we've got things that are really important to our region. Um, and uh, we can't move an interstate. So, um, so we need to be able to kind of figure out where they are and then determine the, the most appropriate actions after that. I will say also that Pima County is a bit um, um, hamstrung. We, we can't create rules that are more stringent than the state. That is um, delegated, that authority is delegated to us by the state. So our particular air pollution rules and the, the rules that we apply through our permitting and compliance processes, um, unless the state were to change those, um, we won't have the ability to make them more stringent. But what we could possibly do is look at other related things, like I mentioned, zoning rules and things along those lines, and really think, thinking about where we want to bring in humans <laughs> to live and work. And, um, and so we could be looking at, you know, kind of just future development plans, um, and then involving the communities on other actions that they might want to see in order to address some of these issues. But that question is kind of difficult to answer until we have a clear picture of what the problem is. Great. Uh, let's see, it looks like one more question may have popped up. Oh, very helpful. Thank you, he says. Okay. Um, yes, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Well, I know we're uh, getting uh, close to time and uh, I think we'll have more questions as time goes on. Maybe we can check in with you and uh, it sounds like the information is going to be publicly available, so um, people who are interested in this can continue to check in and um, and uh, look forward um, to seeing uh, some changes informed by the data you collect. So um, uh, thanks so much. Um, congratulations on putting together this project and getting funding. And um, I think. Uh, you know, obviously air quality is one of the biggest things that affects our health and it's a particularly um, an issue for the most vulnerable, the, the kids in those schools. So i um, glad that uh, um, you all are focusing on this um, important issue and on environmental justice. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, and uh, we'll, um, we have a recording of this that we can make available uh, to our panelists and to participants and those who weren't able to be here today. So thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you.